I hope you're all doing fine these days. Um, the op-eds, the deadline, I think I can extend it until 24th uh, because the last day of class is uh, December 31st. That is the last day of the year as well. And we may also have our simulation on the 28th instead of 21st. So in that respect, you may have your assignments, duties, obligations to have been postponed for about a week. So therefore, um, I strongly recommend you to pay attention to your op-eds. You're still sending me emails whether this and that subject is appropriate. Well, of course, you, you should definitely send an email if you have any doubts about whether the subject is appropriate or not. But uh, I, would, I would like to see you have already understood what an op-ed is how, is, how it should be structured, I mean, what should be the sort of a style of writing. It is not a descriptive piece of uh, written material. You do not express or explain or describe to the reader, this guy says that and the other guy says this. You put in there what you think about a specific situation and you just single out one of, I mean, uh, many of uh, the arguments and have one argument and push it. So, and of course, substantiate it, support it with some other arguments, uh, facts, figures, knowledge, information that you may have that would support your idea. So it is something that, it is an assertive type of piece. I mean, you write something, well, about this issue, here is what I think. And this is why, here is why I think that way. And these are the uh, informations and um, facts, data, whatever, or other people's arguments that are supporting <coughs> my argument or that make me believe that way. So it is not just uh, something that you explain the situation, but there is an opinion that you defend, that you assert, all right? So this is something that you, it is therefore something that has to be almost 100% of your work. It must be original. Um, and if it is unoriginal, of course, this will not be accepted. I mean, as you said, uh, as I said before, um, op-eds must be 100% original. Or at least uh, the idea must be original. Of course, you can benefit from other people's thoughts, other people. Uh, information or writings in order to support your opinion, which I also ask for me to do. But of course, the uh, starting point, the emerging point of your uh, argument must be 100% yours. So that, that's why I don't want you to write term papers. Uh, term papers are usually cut and paste uh, by students or those are the people whom students are commissioned their work. And I don't want to make other people rich. I want you to learn something, not only in terms of substance, but also in terms of writing. So op-eds, therefore, in my opinion, help uh, much more in, in terms of learning and teaching. Uh, today, um, you remember on Tuesday that I <coughs> wrote on the board that the talks with Iran should be extended and should take the form of P5 plus 1 plus 1. And if you just watch the video on Tuesday, podcast, which I believe will be, will soon be available, you can remember me saying that even I made this joke. So um, therefore, on Tuesday, right after the class in the afternoon, in the evening, um, the P5 plus one and, and Iran, of course, uh, have taken the decision to stop these negotiations that, are take, that were taking place in Geneva and continue in late January or early February. Uh, the date will be fixed uh, in Istanbul, which actually supports my opinion that Turkey should be somehow linked to these negotiations. And one reason why I said that was um, there is a huge gap of understanding each other. I mean, neither Iran understands what the West actually wants from Iran uh, to do, and neither the West understand why Iran is doing things that, that it, uh, it is doing. So in that respect, uh, 
Turkey comes into play, and Turkey understands uh, both sides much better than uh, you know these these parties are understanding each other. And, and there is this, therefore, uh, the role of, if not necessarily mediation, because mediation is something else, but something like a facilitator. And Turkey, you know, by bringing Iran and the P5 plus one together, and also providing the ground for. Uh, fruitful discussions and, and you know, create an environment of trust um, may facilitate the uh, process of finding a solution, a resolution to the problem between Iran um, and the West. Actually, this is not a problem between Iran and the West. When I say West, actually P5 plus one, China, Russia, they're all in this uh, basket. And it is not only that concern, it's not only something that concerns Iran, cannot be uh, something that could only concern Iran. I mean, of course, everybody is free to feel either, uh, to be either concerned or not. This is their problem. But from when looked at the issue from Turkey's perspective, Turkey must definitely be concerned with Iran's nuclear capabilities. Of course, so long as these capabilities remain the way Iran claims to be, that is peaceful, 100% peaceful, there is no problem, there is nothing to worry. But as we have seen in the past, on many occasions, once secret documents were released officially, or very recently, when again secret documents were released unofficially, I don't know whether illegally or not, but we have seen that what states are saying or telling the world actually uh, is not exactly what they think and what they do. So therefore, we cannot make 100% sure at this moment uh, in time. I mean, today, uh, the 10th of December 2010, no one can claim exactly 100% that Iran does not or does have um, nuclear ambitions. So there are suspicions, and as I explained before, the best way and the surest way of uh, being certain about whether Iran has or does not have any ambitions to develop nuclear weapons, it is to allow the International Atomic Energy Agency to carry out inspections. What Iran claims, yes, I'm a member of the MPT, I have certain obligations, and according to my obligations, I let the IAEA, according to the model protocol, the earlier protocol, uh, IMSERG 153, uh, which was documented, negotiated back in 1970, and since then, Iran is uh, being inspected according to that document, which, of course, was found many years ago as being weak, as having shortcomings, loopholes, and therefore the IAEA's verification mechanism was enhanced by developing, by um, drafting another document which was called additional protocol as a result of a study called Program 93 plus 2. So therefore, Iran in order to uh, provide assurances to the international community that whatever they say actually is correct, then there should be no reason why they should not let the IAEA carry out these inspections. Of course, from legal standpoint, from international law perspective, Iran is not obliged legally, it's not obliged legally to allow the IAEA go everywhere the IAEA would like to go because it is not subject to the additional protocol. They have signed it, but they have not ratified it. And therefore, they cannot be held responsible or uh, they cannot be uh, uh, held res uh, accountable for, for whatever provisions the additional protocol would require any country. But since they are subject to model protocol, the earlier one, the weakest one, then, of course, the IAEA's inspections and the verification mechanisms cannot provide enough assurances for the rest of the world, including Turkey. So in this respect, we, while Iran has the right to claim that they do not do anything wrong, the rest of the world, in the absence of full scope inspections that would provide assurances, the rest of the world also has the right to be suspicious of, about Iran's capabilities. So the only way to solve this problem is to let the IAEA go wherever the IAEA would like to go and carry out whatever inspections they would like. If, I, I told this to many of my Iranian colleagues, Iranian diplomats here in Ankara when they visited me in my office or whenever I saw them in receptions or whenever I went to Iran. 
I mean, if you have nothing to hide, just let the inspectors go and carry out uh, inspections and give uh, you a, a clean bill, a bill of health. So, well, they say it's a matter of sovereignty. Fine, of course, it is a matter of sovereignty for you, but it's also a matter of security for us. And if you, in the coming years or decades, somehow provided that, I mean, uh, <coughs> or given the fact that you, you have all these infrastructures, if you one day, if not this sort of administration today, but five years from today or ten years from today, if the next generation of administra administrators, executives in Iran, decide to divert from peaceful to military applications, what can we do? So therefore, this is a problem, as I said, that should concern everybody, not only China, not only Germany, not only this and that, but Turkey, whether or not anybody is concerned or not. Turkey must uh, be concerned because it is a problem which will be right next to it. I mean, geographically speaking, and also politically speaking, Iran and Turkey over the last uh, approximately four or five centuries did not have uh, serious confrontations. Well, the history can be interpreted different ways. There are historians who claim that even after, after uh, Kassel-Shrin Treaty 1639, Turks and Persians have fought each other and there were some disputes and that the uh, borders, uh, the common borders, did not remain exactly the same as some people claim. Well, whatever the historical facts might be, but in a uh, sort of a, a macro uh, uh, sort of assessment of the situation, what we see is that except for a short period after Islamic Revolution, and more specifically after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And for reasons that I uh, explain here, as you should remember, uh, the West did not want Iran to uh, go into the former Soviet Republic, uh, republics and uh, sort of uh, transform these republics in such a way that, would sort of, uh, that they would take the uh, Iranian regime as, as a model for them. So there was a competition between Turkey and Iran and Iran's uh, uh, foreign policy was quite assertive against, against Turkey. That was pretty much uh, late 80s and more specifically early 1990s until I would say 98, 99 when the two countries have finally figured out that their interest, especially after 9-11, uh, that their interests were uh, actually um, is in uh, sort of having good relations rather than competition. So beyond that, Turks and Iranians or Persians did not have uh, much of a problem in terms of uh, security issues. I mean, they were wise enough not to confront each other because when you look at the map, what you see is more or less uh, uh, two powers of equal size, if not ge geographically equal, but Turks and Persians have always been throughout history uh, powerful sort of uh, nations. Um, the, the geographical location, I mean, the high mountains did not allow uh, the two sort of countries to fight effectively. That, and they, both sides, knew very well that there would be no winner. I mean, or at least they would harm each other, they would cause damage to each other, but they would not be better off by fighting. So, the, I mean, the, the, the mere fact that the uh, Turks and Persians have not fought in the history was partly because they were pretty much from the same family. This is, uh, th there is this understanding. We have common culture, history, common heritage. Well, that's one fact, but sometimes even brothers kill each other. I mean, in history, in families, in, in uh, empires, etc. So, but that was one reason, but the second reason was the two were wise enough not to fight because uh, they knew very well that they could not win the war. I mean, so, so far, with the existing military capabilities, with the current, you know, uh, geographical, uh, you know, uh, locations, each being right next to to, to others, so um, it would not be wise, or at least no party would feel uh, powerful enough to exert its own political will on the other side. So neither Iran can put much pressure on Turkey to do something, nor Turkey can put much pressure on Iran to do something. I mean, if you want to understand better what I mean, just go back to 1998, when Turkey pressurized on Syria to re release the head of PKK, Erdogan, and then because Turkey was powerful enough to carry out military operation if Syria did not 
uh, comply with what Turkey asked from them. So uh, what I mean is deterrence. So neither Iran nor Turkey can have enough uh, capabilities for the time being at present time and for the last several centuries that was the case to um, make the other side behave in a certain way. But if and when, we don't know where Iran will ever have nuclear weapons, but if and when Iran acquires nuclear weapons, Turkey will be in a difficult situation. Because, um, for instance, we, I mean, we discussed these things you know, in bits and pieces. For instance, the Gulf nations, of course, the Gulf uh, nations in like um, Bahrain, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Oman, and, and others, uh, United Arab Emirates, well, of course, they are feeling, they are perceiving a threat, and this is something that also came out from the WikiLeaks documents that almost all of them either collectively or individually ask from the United States and maybe from Israel, I don't know, uh, to do something to stop Iran. And, but because they, they at present perceive as a powerful threat and if and when Iran acquires these uh, military capabilities, the threat will only be augmented, will only be aggravated, increased. When you look at the uh, other countries in the region, Actually, there will, be, there will not be a change in the sign of the threat perception. That is, if there is a threat, the threat will be uh, uh, slightly or more, depending on the situation, depending on which country we're talking about, will be increased or will remain the same. But in the case of Turkey, Iran, of course, the, the current balance, the parity between Turkey and Iran, which exists for the last few centuries, will be tipped in favor of Iran. And Iran may have leverages to use against Turkey in order to uh, impose some of its political will. Of course, Turkey will likely to remain a member of NATO, and that will be a deterrent against Iran. But still, uh, Iranian administration, I'm not talking about today. I'm talking about future possible contingencies. This, these contingencies may be realized or may, may not at all be realized. We don't know. But the task of an analyst, task of a strategist, is to tinker on this kind of contingencies and to come up with policy suggestions as to what to do in case such and such thing happens. What I'm saying is, if and when Iran acquires nuclear weapons and Turkey does not, and of course, what I want or what I always suggest is that Turkey should, under no conditions, develop nuclear weapons. This is something that we can, separate, uh, uh, we can discuss separately. But on the other hand, if Iran does have nuclear weapons, that will, that will be something which will work in favor of Iran and to the disadvantage of Turkey. So therefore, Turkey has all the reasons to be con uh, concerned as well as to be involved in this process. It is not something that Turkey can let to the P5 plus one. It is not something that Turkey can sit and wait until P5 plus one is pleased enough to do a favor or not to Iran. It is something that Turkey must just take a role. Even if there is nobody to assign a role to Turkey, Turkey should not wait for permission. Turkey should somehow connect itself, attach itself to the uh, issue. This is something that I kept saying for the last two years. It is not something that we can let to others. It is our problem. It is not, even it is not their problem. China, Russia, they cannot be threatened by Iran's nuclear weapons because they have their hundreds of nuclear weapons already. They have their powerful military economic capabilities. They have huge territories. So is the United States. And what about France, UK? They also have nuclear weapons and they are far too away from Iran and they don't have anything in common or in terms of dispute and they do not, you know, uh, they, they, there, there is not much ground for them to be extremely concerned about Iran's military capabilities even if Iran develops nuclear weapons in the future. Neither is Germany. And I, I can you know, show you a number of articles written by German scholars, analysts, policy planners, uh, and even uh, statesmen who until very recently, until Ahmadinejad made all these statements about Zionism, Israel, Jew, Judaism, Judaism, etc., they were remotely concerned with what Iran was doing. They said, well, why, why should we care? I mean, Iran does not have any capabilities. 
to touch us. I mean, why, why should we be caring about it? So none of the P5 plus one actually is any tangible reason, maybe except the United States because there is this hostility between the US and Iran at this at rhetorical level. And also, the United States is not necessarily concerned for itself, but more specifically because of Israel being in the Middle East, well, being in the range of, within the range of uh, Iranian ballistic missiles. So, therefore, there was no other solution but to make this P5 plus one to add Turkey as another plus one. So, well, by declaring that um, the next round of discussions will take place uh, in Istanbul, uh, do we solve all the problems? No. Because there, there is reason to be optimistic just because of the mere fact that the um, negotiations will be taking place in Istanbul, that, that Turkey will have a, a certain capability to influence this process and maybe push toward a real resolution, a diplomatic solution. But there are also um, reasons why we cannot be too much optimistic. Because, especially when I heard uh, Jalili, uh, the head of uh, Iranian delegation which conducted you know, these negotiations, who took over from Sultaniye, another ambassador whom I knew very well in person, a very you know, tough diplomat, and also uh, a scientist and a, an engineer professor. Uh, he gave a very hard time to the you know, uh, other parties uh, who negotiated with Iran. And Jalili said, well, in Istanbul, we will not be talking about suspension of enrichment. This is our sovereign right, and we will not you know, uh, back down. Well, if this is really going to be the situation, then that will be the end of history, well, in, of diplomacy. Because the only reason why I was saying and, and that, I, you know, that Turkey should be somehow annexed to the process and that negotiations should take place in Turkey was because of the influence that Turkey had, as we have seen on Iran, uh, and which led Iran to signing the Tehran Protocol, the declaration in Tehran on May 17th, as you will remember this year, um, Tehran Declaration. And this is the declaration uh, signed by Turkey, Brazil, and Iran. And this is the only official document, because these are the foreign ministers who have signed it. It's not just NGOs or just not you know, a piece of paper which has no um, official value. No, this declaration had uh, a very powerful meaning and value actually in, in terms of um, legitimacy and legality of this declaration. And uh, in this uh, sort of uh, setting, we, we, we should remember or at least those who don't know should bear in mind that Tehran has not given its signature to any other document over the at least 10 years. Because, especially since the revelations which came in August 2002 uh, from the um, Mujahideen Halk, uh, the, uh, the, the popular resistance movement in Iran, actually you know, their representatives in Washington, D.C., revealed to the world the, the existence of Natan's <coughs> nuclear uh, uh, uranium enrichment facility in 2002. And since then, Iran is high on the agenda. Iran has been subject to many criticism. There were too many initiatives. Remember the EU tree that I mentioned in the previous uh, this, uh, sort of classes. So even there was this EU tree initiative between, uh, as I written, 2003 November and more or less March uh, 2005 within this one and a half year period. Yes, Iran suspended temporarily its enrichment activities. Actually, at that time, Iran did not have enough enrichment capability anyway, and also acted as if the additional protocol were in force. But they have not signed anything official. So this is the Tehran Declaration is the only official document that Iran signed. 
So Turkey was powerful enough, politically speaking, to influence Iran together with Brazil. Of course, not to forget Brazil's influence on Iran either. So Turkey and Brazil have convinced Iran that it will be in its best interest to sign the protocol, the, the, the Tehran Declaration. So stemming from this, I mean, just uh, uh, or, or being encouraged with this, I, sus I, I, I believe that Turkey, when these P5 plus 1 uh, negotiations between P5 plus 1 and Iran take um, place in Istanbul, Turkey will definitely be somehow connected or annexed to the uh, process, and Turkey will be able to use its influence. But if Iran behaves the way they declare by Jalili, that in Istanbul they will not be talking about uranium enrichment, but they will be talking about the proliferation of nuclear weapons in the world and the securities. Well, we, we just discussed this issue back in the United Kingdom last weekend. So we don't need any more discussions. We know what the problems are. The problem is uh, the attitude of Iran as well as the attitude of the West and the P5 plus one, which actually altogether blocked the way to finding a resolution. So if they insist on some of the uh, uh, policies that they displayed against P5 plus one, the Istanbul meeting will not be a success, and that will be the end of diplomatic initiatives, because the, I can't see any other candidate on the horizon which could replace uh, Turkey, maybe Brazil. I don't think they will be uh, going to Rio de Janeiro or just Sao Paulo, wherever, uh, to discuss these issues, because most likely Brazil will also be coming to uh, Istanbul or will be somehow present in the process. So, I mean, when Iran uh, actually asked the P5 plus one to, to start negotia negotiating again, uh, they asked to have this meeting in Istanbul before, I mean, just uh, in, in late October or early November, I mean, just past month. But the P5 plus one said no, for reasons that I can understand. But then they said, okay, let's again come together in Geneva, well, Geneva is understandable because it's, it is the headquarters of the United Na Nations offices in Geneva. I mean, and the, the previous headquarters of the League of Nations. So Geneva is the uh, home to many international organizations and therefore it's, it's, it, it is seen as uh, a city where diplomacy reigns. I mean, you know, uh, imposes itself. So dip it's a dip it diplomacy sort of center. They said, okay, let's get together in Geneva, and if there is no agreement, we can then think about going to Turkey. So, as we have seen, uh, there, nothing came out of the two days discussions, and this decision now is to uh, meet uh, in Istanbul. So, it is up to Iran, of course, and the P5 plus one, and Turkey, to push for a resolution of the problem. Because, um, otherwise, again, as I said, unless these resolutions, uh, these neg negotiations pave the way to at least being uh, hopeful that there can be you know, a light at the end of the tunnel you know, after walking enough down this road of diplomacy, then of course there will be other mechanisms uh, which will be introduced by some of the actors. The United States, as we have seen on these slides, at the beginning has long considered diplomacy, especially during the Bush period, as a waste of time. And they were quite uh, nervous about the EU3 initiative because they thought EU3 enabled Iran to use time, to gain time for accomplishing whatever it was doing. But as I also said then, United States was not ready to take any action or to do anything of its own because they could not put anything on the table other than criticizing the EU3 initiative. So the EU3 initiative may have gained time Iran, which actually did in terms of Iran advancing its capabilities. Look where, where Iran was back in 2003 and where they are today. Because just uh, before the uh, Geneva talks uh, at the beginning of this week, um, Iran made a official statement that they have completed the nuclear fuel cycle. 
the nuclear fuel cycle is very important because uh, there are uh, certain steps in the nuclear fuel cycle. I mean, this is extraction uh, of uh, uranium from the earth, and then you make it into, of course, so after some purification, yellow cake, which is the initial, well, it's not a cake, don't try, um, which is uh, uh, the initial uh, sort of cleaned up uranium, which is ready for conversion, fuel conversion. At certain stage, there is this, of course, enrichment and or processing, well, of course, uh, reactor generation, uh, electricity generation reactor, then waste treatment, so, and reprocessing. Iran said they have this fuel, complete fuel cycle. Well, of course, we have to rely on the official statements made by the Iranians, in that they have, and we also know from various sources, some of them are their sources, their statements, their declarations, and some of them are other sources which you know, rely on credible intelligence, some satellite pictures, some reports of uh, credible scientists or groups, think tanks, etc. So this, uh, the, we know that they have all this. But how effectively they can use and at, in what capacities, we don't know. But what is important to bear in mind is that Iran has become pretty much self-sustainable. Uh, so, uh, and uh, th that was something which I had pointed out in my article back in 1995. Fifteen years ago, the article title is Iran Going Nuclear, something that I had written uh, when I saw this, the text of the uh, agreement between Russia and Iran, that Iran was investing in not only technology transfer, but also sending its students, graduate students and doctoral students to Russian institutions to get their doctoral degrees from advanced Russian institutions. And as I've written in my other article published in 2006, it's available on my website, the Good for the Shah article, from 1995 to uh, 2005, within 10 years, there were some 200 plus Iranians who earned their PhDs from Russian institutions. This is something that an Iranian bureaucrat who was in charge of this program to send you know, students to, to Russia and, and organize whatever uh, he was doing. So therefore, and since then, possibly there were maybe another 56 or maybe 100 students who earned their degrees because Iran um, had put a clause, uh, an item in the text of the contract with, with Russia that every year 20, 30 students would be sent to Russian institutions. So some of them might have failed, some, some of them might have been um, unsuccessful, but most of them, I believe, were successful and earned their degrees already. So Iran has become a, a nuclear-capable uh, country. But of course, um, this is something that uh, we should also bear in mind and to be uh, hopeful that there can be a peaceful resolution uh, to this conflict. Because Iran would, would definitely not like to see its nuclear facilities being destroyed after a military operation by Israel, by the United States, or uh, both of them. Because Iran wants to become a nuclear supplier state. Not only want, you know, do they want to you know, advance these capabilities for themselves, but also they want to be in a position to export nuclear technology to NAM countries, NAM being non-aligned movement countries. They still exist. The world has changed, but NAM still is there. Well, whether it has any significance or not, that's a different question. But also to Islamic states, because Iran propagates in these countries and tell them, look, the West will never give you nuclear technology. I can give you nuclear technology that you need so protect me, uh, just support me against the pressures coming from the P5 plus one and other countries. And if you bear with me, if you trust me, if you support me, 
in the future I will share technology with you and no one, no one else will give you this technology. So in order to mobilize international support, Iran does want to use its nuclear capabilities for this reason. So for, in order to be in, in such a position of a supplier, Iran must have its nuclear facilities intact. They should not be damaged, they should not be destroyed by any military operation. And therefore, of course, there should be no room for a military operation. There should be no reason for a military operation, I mean, well, from the U.S. perspective. So long as diplomacy succeeds, there is no reason to resort to military power, right? So therefore, Iran must be aware of the fact that after all these rounds of unsuccessful talks with the P5 plus one, there is one uh, precedent which was successful was Turkey-Brazil-Iran swap deal. Whether it was a very efficient document or not, that's a different question. What is important here is that Tehran, for this or that reason, put its signature on only one document, which was this one. And therefore, Turkey's role is significant here. And Iran must also facilitate Turkey's role to be a facilitator. But if Iran insists the way they declare to the world, which I believe is a diplomatic maneuvering, and of course they would like to set the stage high in order to be able to you know, get more from negotiations, from bargaining. But of course, Iranians are definitely very good diplomats very skillful diplomats, but so are Turkish diplomats, so are P5 plus one diplomats. So there is no reason to you know, think that the other side will be a dumb person who would just you know, come to the bargaining table at the uh, sort of level that is set by you. So Iran must acknowledge that P5 plus one and Iran and Turkey sitting around a table should be able to really find a breakthrough. Uh, 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 otherwise, there are all these reasons out there why some countries may differently go and act in such a way that Iran will not be pleased with the end result, one of which might be total destruction of some of their very significant capabilities. So, of course, nobody wants that. At least from Turkey's perspective, this is not the ideal situation because another confrontation in Turkey's region will add more to the tension in the region and it is, of course, not going to be compatible with uh, the foreign policy objectives of Turkey, which is not to have any tension with the neighbors. That is zero conflict policy. Of course, this will not be a conflict which will be between Turkey and Iran directly, but Turkey will be in a very uneasy position, in a very difficult position, because it will be caught between Iran and the West, and Turkey being a member of NATO. And we don't know how this you know, confrontation, if, if it ever occurs militarily, we don't know to what extent it could be escalating. So, therefore, it is very, very crucial to have uh, or to use this, I'm sorry, um, this uh, uh, chance for diplomacy in Istanbul next month. So, possibly toward the end of the uh, month, January, may, maybe early February, or there may be some consecutive rounds of talks in Istanbul. Well, uh, as I always said this when, when, whenever I'm with the diplomats, the one reason why some negotiations take place, uh, take for a long time, is because of the city where these negotiations are taking place. I don't know if you've been to Geneva, but it's a very beautiful city. I spent uh, three months fellowship at the United Nations. I st uh, lived there for three months, and I've been there on different occasions for conferences, uh, meetings, whatever. It's a, it's a beautiful city. And diplomats are really very happy to be, th to be there. And they, they, they possibly extend the, these negotiations and, and all these talks. Maybe, well, it, it may not sound very serious, but there is always this uh, you know, uh, element that because Geneva is a very nice city, uh, diplomats do not mind sitting around a table for an extended duration of negotiations. So is Istanbul. And whenever I go to you know, conferences, especially those who come from uh, big 
industrialized countries which do not have necessarily very nice spots like Istanbul, and also the ones uh, who come from the Middle East, they love being in Istanbul. So I hope Istanbul itself, my hometown, um, I wish I was there right now, um, together with you, of course. Um, Istanbul might also help facilitate finding a solution. And if they conduct these negotiations at the Trump Palace Hotel, where I used to play soccer when Beşiktaş was using this for training, and I was a little kid, and I was called to play for Beşiktaş, by the way. Um, Mom didn't allow. Anyway, uh, well, if they have this setting right looking over the Bosphorus, they will possibly be falling in love with not only Istanbul, but also each other, and they will find a diplomatic solution. That's what we hope. Otherwise, I mean, to be serious, this is going to uh, a much tougher situation because in my discussions with uh, Americans, Chinese, Russians, French, and the British, and the Germans, I mean, the P5 plus one, myself, in my personal individual academic capacity, I have no official capacity, <coughs> no authorization, nothing, just you know, my knowledge and myself. When I discuss this issue with this and why they turned down the swap deal, why they did not accept or support swap deal, they all made some comments, some, some uh, put forward some claims, some explanations, none of which actually were satisfactory, and they knew it. But, and when I, when I insisted that Turkey, this swap deal must be given a chance and that next round should be in Turkey, well, they were suspicious. Now that they have agreed upon having the next round in Istanbul, of course, this time they will turn to us and to me when they see me, of course. Okay, now we have given this chance to you. Let's see what you can do. So, therefore, for Turkey to be successful, Iran must definitely help Turkey to be successful, for itself to be successful in its uh, endeavors in, with, in you know, advancing its nuclear capabilities for peaceful purposes, hopefully. So, uh, next Tuesday, we will continue with this subject. Of course, uh, you might think it is all about Iran, but just look around you. It's what you see is almost Iran-related policy in the Middle East. Middle East peace process, nuclear issue, and everything. So we are not stuck with Iran only, but we look at the perspectives of other countries, not only the region countries, but also uh, other countries from other parts of the region. So I'll see you on Tuesday. And tell your friends who are not present today that the deadline for uh, op-eds is pushed to the 24th and that the simulation will take place on the 28th all right, of December. I'll see you next Tuesday.